Okay. So I hope this works. <clears throat> Okay, can everybody see it all right? Can you see the slideshow? Looks good. Yeah, okay, and you can hear us. We should have our picture. Can you see us somewhere in the talk, Matt? Yeah. <clears throat> I think maybe if we just speak up, it'll show up. There it is, do you see it? I'm gonna move this a little so we can see both of us. <laughs> Um, we're very pleased, very happy to uh, have uh, Ed Carrier, a Squamish elder, master weaver, uh, who I've been working with on a new project, which is basically uh, the covers the first half of his life. He calls making a living off the land because from his birth in 1934, uh, uh, he was raised by his great grandmother and basically supported by uh, shellfish, fish, uh, lots of ducks, and uh, also uh, mammals, some of his uncles. This is a, we're on an allotment that was passed on from uh, the last chief of the uh, Suquamish, Chief uh, Wahalchu, gave it to his only daughter, Julia Jacobs, who Ed was raised by, uh, from infancy, and and then she, since Ed took care of her all of his life, she willed the rest of the allotment to him. So I'll show you a map of that. And uh, uh oh, <clears throat> this doesn't seem to be going. I'm going to have to go in and out of this to make sure it works. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, this is our next speaker. We've been talking to uh, Dr. Lin and Dr. Haman uh, Karama. And feel free to speak up if you wanna mention something. This is the pelt that Ed and they were talking about at the Smithsonian that was collected by George Gibbs, one of our first real historians. He worked with uh, Stevens on the treaty councils in the 1850s. Uh, but he, uh, he, he skinned his, uh, hair dog. He got evidently from, I think, Cowichan and maybe, uh, uh, Audrey and, and Liz can straighten me out on that. But, uh, but when Dr. Lynn found out about that, she tracked it down in 2002 and she's a genetic specialist. So she's able to determine how much, uh, uniqueness the the these indian dogs had compared to uh, non-indian dogs anything you want to add to that but we really appreciate you coming in uh in may on our zoom program program yeah the uh, mutton the dog uh, actually came he was acquired in chilliwack now we don't know if the dog was born in chilliwack but he was acquired in chilliwack and it said the leg tag said from the chilliwack indians so it doesn't say how he obtained them. Nope, just where. Yeah. But that'll be a... Anything you want to add to that, Dr. Lynn? This must be you working on uh, measuring it. Yes. Yes, so that was when... Um, so that was... Me, that's me and, uh, and Dr. Melissa Hawkins. She is the curator of mammals at the Smithsonian. And uh, we're measuring mutton's pelt because um, a Karen Carr, a scientific artist, she is there on on the computer there on Zoom. She's directing us as where where we should measure mutton for um, because she she made a scientific reconstruction of him. Mm. So uh, it was really incredible what what she was able to do, and she is is um, so so skilled and so talented. She had been commissioned by many museums um, across the country, and also by by the the Smithsonian um, Natural History Museum um, in in several of the of the 
the halls there and the human origins hall and I believe in the fossils hall, you know, um, creating reconstructions of extinct megafauna of extinct animals. So, um, so mm -hmm. it was, so I had reached out to her um, to see if we could commission if we, but um, we actually didn't have any funding for on the project. So we couldn't really, we couldn't afford her, but she volunteered her, her time for this because she really wanted to do it. So oh. it was, it, so she had spent um, more than a year yeah. creating the reconstruction of mutton. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. Audrey too is looking for any remnants of the wool dogs today. So Ed, if you see another one, <laughs> find out who owns it. And I've seen him out in EM Bay too quite often in the 70s and 80s. Uh, so uh, this is uh, making a living off the land against the first half of Ed's uh, life. We're documenting and uh, certainly was living off the land and the tides and, uh, and the water. Uh, this started with this book, many of you have, uh, where we did go out and particularly uh, Ed replicated these ancient archaeological wet site baskets, similar to what I'm digging down in uh, Mud Bay. Some of you have been to Mud Bay with a site we did with the uh, Squaxins. Those are clam baskets, very much like uh, wow. Ed's. Uh, and that led in, in part, that led to Ed being really recognized uh, nationally. Uh, and he's gotten three national awards in the last uh, uh, couple of years. And the first one with a, a Community Spirit Award from the First People's Fund. And it's a cultural award from the Native community that runs this program. Uh, last year, we got the Society for American Archaeology Award for Excellence in Archaeological Analysis, uh, and, and that's uh, science recognition. And then the arts, with the National Endowment with the, for the Arts, uh, <clears throat> gave him the National Heritage Fellowship Award. He's wearing a medallion now. <laughs> I, I thought it was going to be pure gold, but it sort of is. Let me, uh, yeah, you can, I, I'll move into it. Like, yeah, that'd be nice if it was gold at, uh, that's uh, big, $2,000 an ounce. But, uh, uh, it's way up. Oh my God. Do you want to say anything about these awards, Ed? Or what? Well, these awards are uh, completely, uh, uh amazing uh, surprise to me that making that little clam basket uh way way back would ever lead to any award or anything and and uh getting these awards uh inspires it uh it makes you uh, want to it makes you want to get out there and teach and inspire others to weave and and uh, get this art uh, get this artwork out there and and it and it just it really helps that way to to continue uh, continue that uh, that part of it and and has. Uh, as elders in, of the tribe, why uh, that's one of our duties is to uh, to teach and pass any knowledge that we have that we have stored up and, and pass that on. And one of the things that I uh, I'd like to point out as part of that passing it on that Ed. Uh, uh, had uh, support for his granddaughter and her and his three great grandchildren to come to the uh, uh, the, uh, the United States Archives when he got the National Endowment Award. Well, one one thing is when you uh, are awarded something, uh, 
precious or something like this. Uh, the native way is to have it uh, have witnesses on hand. So that's why I wanted my uh, my granddaughter Jesse and her three children, my great grandchildren, to be there. So that Jesse and Raya and Cody and Lily could all be there and witness this uh, this presentation. Yeah, Cody's fifteen and Lily's four, thirteen, I think, 15. and and uh, uh, and the youngest is about five. But they'll remember. They'll remember <laughs> this. Uh, time for their great 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 great. Age. Oh, yeah, absolutely what's that great. <clears throat> yeah. so we'll we'll get into this and i just wanted to show here's a picture of uh of, of ed uh let me get a uh a pointer here uh, ed's halfway through his dip net which he he finished to this morning for you he's got a uh, form to this show. is smelt here that they that he used to catch with dip nets uh growing up when the, uh when the smelt come in to spawn on the sandy beaches around here why you would have this kind of a dip net to to stand out in the water and uh, and dip them and and catch them with this uh, with this type of uh, with this type of a uh, uh, of a dip net here. I and, think you can and, see it's beautifully finished. And I was uh, I was challenged by the museum down there on the Columbia River. The uh, the Maritime Museum down in Astoria there to make this uh, this authentic type dill dip net. So I had to use uh, like a, like a hazelnut uh, limb here, which is native to the to our area. And then I had to uh, split cedar limbs in half and uh, and fasten them to the to the pole here kind of to clamps. the handle. And then I had to uh, figure out a way to get the spruce root to bind the to bind it to the handle and bind it all with spruce root. And I had to split these cedar limbs in half. And then I had to twist cordage to fasten the netting loops to the framework. And it was quite a challenge. <laughs> it, was, it was really a challenge to make something that you didn't have, I didn't have much of an idea. How am I gonna do this anyway? He says so, there's 150 nettle stalks that he had to process to make these 250 feet of nettle fiber strings. Three strand. You can kind of see there are multiple strand here. And so I finally uh, I finally finished it this morning so we could have it here <laughs> for the show. So we thank you for that. <laughs> I thought he finished it yesterday, but he's still working on it this morning for you guys. Yeah. Any questions on that real quick? On go ahead and just blurt them out, I think, if you have your mic on. Uh somebody might have a question on that. <laughs> but we didn't have time. It's too rainy here to go down on the beach and uh, we're gonna get some uh rubber smell <laughs> and put them out and dip them out. Now we'll get some good pictures for our this this work we're doing living off the land because this is part of him getting uh, the smelt when they're what are they doing? They're spawning down on the sand spit, and those are used for like bait. 
And maybe some food. Oh, the food, they're really good eating. They're really wonderful. Uh, fry them up. Oh, they're really delicious. They're really a, a really wonderful fish. <laughs> I want to come in and say thank you very much for doing that. That's an extraordinary yeah. effort. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate that. Right. Uh, he's working hard all the time. I know that. But these are what we uh, statistically I, I showed from 2000 years ago. The Beaterbo site, which is this red dot, uh, links up stylistically, stylistically through time to Ed Carrier and his great grandmother who raised him, Julia Jacobs, and uh, Wishy Dots, her mom, and down to Co the Coquas site, Mud Bay site, Conway. And that really shows with cladistics from the back and forward, bottom forward, stylistic continuity for 4,000 years. And that's when we said, well, other cultural practices like uh, making a living off the land might show continuity in the archaeological sites. Uh, Ed went from, uh, I should do it this way, went from here as far back as he could to learn these styles of five or six generations back, he never realized that, in fact, we were finding them archaeologically. They're basically in museums uh, for as much as 4,000 years. And uh, so uh, that really opened his eyes when we were able to get into the Burke and get into the UBC Museum of Anthro to work with multi, you know, uh, millennium old old baskets i'm sorry anyway let's uh but that that set it up and we have to greatly uh credit his great grandmother that raised him julia jacobs here's the earliest picture i could find from tt T. waterman uh who worked with her as a linguist uh, and Ed, when he started to make baskets, you know, when he was was fourteen, uh, specializing in what she taught him, uh, clam baskets, which he made to collect clams. He didn't make them to sell. He made it to make spending money and made them to collect clams back when he was fourteen. Here's here's a good example of a of a clam basket. Uh, and uh, he's made hundreds of these in his lifetime so far. Um, was able, but you want to say anything about Julia? Or she she's well represented in our work here because she taught him a lot that she learned from being raised in uh, in a plank house, very early old man house. So I was fortunate to have been raised by my great grandma. Uh, she was one of the last weavers for the of the Suquamish tribal people, even though she was not Suquamish, but she learned from uh, Chief Wahalchu and his wife, Wisido, uh, living in old man house on Agate Pass there. And so she knew the, the Indian ways. She knew... Uh, uh, the weaving and when I was uh, 8, 10, 12 years old watching her weave these baskets so then when I was 14 I finally I finally made one it was very rough and crude but it was a gathering basket and I used it for 3 years before it finally kind of fell apart and now I wish I would have saved it. I, I threw it away because it fell apart. <laughs> but I should have I should have saved it and had that very first one. <laughs> yeah, and she uh, taught Ed a lot about what they needed to survive as far as making a living off the land in terms of shellfish and did all the cooking. He often collected and butchered but uh, she was uh directing that and and right where we're where we are right here in this building is the old house that he he grew up in 
Yeah, my, uh, this was a really tiny house here that I, <laughs> that I lived in for a while. And then, then we, uh, my great grandma's uh, son built her an, a nice house, a fairly nice house that I was raised in. And uh, I was born right here on this land and, uh, and uh, enjoyed living here all my, all my life here and uh, weaving these baskets and keeping up the, keeping up that, keeping that uh, culture, that art alive. Yeah, he, um, this is kind of like a village. It's the allotment he inherited and, and he grew up with his uh, big family. So he, like she said, her, his great uncle, his other uncles, his mom and others uh, all worked together. Uh, as a commute as a uh, uh, yeah. like a village to make their living uh, back in the early days i didn't uh i didn't know my father and i never did meet him and i was the only child so i didn't have anybody to uh fight with or compete with or anything so uh <laughs> so i uh uh, my uh, my teachers were my uh, my immediate family my my uncles my stepdad my step grandfather my uh, my grandmas my my great grandma my my great auntie and and my great uncle and all those people uh, just uh, helped me learn all kinds of different things to all oh, carpentry, any kind of repair work that might be needed on a home, uh, climbing and topping big trees, falling trees, uh, gardening, uh, uh, and so, so learning all that way, as I was growing up, I was able to build my own house, well, build, I built this house that we're in now, it's right next to us, and then, beautiful. Uh, and then next door, I got the, my other house that I built, and I built other buildings, and and so uh, uh, I learned all these things by uh, by being uh, living close with my immediate family and learning what they. My uncle Herman taught me how to fish. Uh, how to repair a gill net and get it out there and catch salmon and <laughs> and my yeah. uncle Irvin taught me how to shoot a shotgun. <laughs> I was only twelve years old and you need to shoot your own ducks, you know. You need to buy a so I bought a a Cirrus Roebuck shotgun there and out of the catalog and then I was able to uh, it's a 12-gauge uh, J.C. Higgins gun, 12-gauge uh, <laughs> shotgun. And once I learned how to shoot that, well, I, I was always bringing home a lot of ducks for Grandma to cook and have wonderful duck stew and things yeah. like that. <laughs> yeah, we... Uh... We sat for many, many, many hours in his house over here, taping Ed, and uh, had a Dragon software, so I t made it into text, and then I listened to the tape. So the work we've done is in his words in that part. We're basically putting together a book on all this, and uh, he says he's like an only child. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I know he had tons of cousins. He had lots of kids to play with. <laughs> he wasn't he wasn't just out here alone as a kid. He had lots of cousins all over the place. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have nothing but cousins. <laughs> Cousins, but cousins, that's good. <laughs> I mean, it's like no father. He had plenty of fathers through his uncles and stepdads, and, uh, and brothers and sisters through his cousins, who many are still with us. But. Yeah, my uh, my uncles and my grandmas and uh, my step my stepdad, my step grandpa. They were my they were my fathers. They were my like my teachers my they were like uh like fathers to me yeah so we talk about this as an extended family village essentially to make to survive uh for the first half of his life and we've seen this uh the archaeology basket at the beginning but that was how we put together like a book of the different ancient waves through time that we could statistically say definitely link up with 200 uh grandparents as teachers and this is on the very back of our book he wanted a full-size picture of it on the back so our hypothesis is if this works for basketry uh it should work for other cultural practices if this generationally linked archaeology works for basketry so he asked me to record living off the land which is from First half of his life, 1934 to 1970, raised by his great grandmother, Julia, and mostly living off these resources. So I soon realized that if basketry reflected Salish traditions for 4,000 years, an archaeological fauna and flora analysis near Ed's home should reflect his upbringing with Julia Jacobson family over town. I don't know if we have Ina with, I, I, Ian with us. That uh, he's he's working on the wool dogs as their zooarchaeologist. Just to show you where we are right now, there's Ed's allotment, where his great grandmother uh, spent a, uh, the beginning of her life this big plank house called Old Man House, and we'll show you these areas of fishing and hunting and uh, shell fishing down here at Jeff Heads, which he would get to by boat usually about three miles and uh, this is indianola here um and so we looked uh within 20 miles of Ed, ed's house unfortunately uh researchers have tabulated the fauna and flora in nine sites within 20 miles of ed's place here's ed and these sites by uh, Virginia Butler and Sarah Campbell have been well presented in an old man house very close and where Julia grew up very well, you know, fairly well documented. It's fauna and flora by work by Randall Schalk and David Rhodes. And we also look at comparisons with some other sites that are well known, like Ozette and Hoko and Mud Bay. <clears throat> um, but we came up with easily over 44 uh, natural resources that are detailed by Ed's. We cannot go through them all tonight, <laughs> but we definitely uh, see these kinds of uh, little neck and butter clams. And we'll talk about horse clams and uh, fish. We'll look at salmon, of course. We've talked a little bit about smelt. Birds, now, Ed didn't say this, but he was really into duck hunting, and there's at least eight or nine species of ducks he knew very well, from diving ducks to dabbling ducks. Um, when it comes to the, the deer, um, that's usually a specialty in the village, and his uncles were very good deer hunters. Ed didn't deer hunt. Um, Bears were rare, but he, he they did ha get them here on the allotment. Berries, uh, when we look at flora, we'll look at uh, some of the berries that Ed and his, they collected for his great-grandmother and they stored. Fuel wood we'll look at, which is basically bark he got off the beach for her his grandma great-grandma's cook stove. 
And we'll talk a little bit about making. We've already done that a little bit. Lamb baskets with cedar limbs, cedar roots, and bark. And he's a canoe carver. He's done two full sea going canoes. So that's a material for making a living off the land, uh, the wood. And then various roots and binding materials like cherry. We talked a bit already about stinging us, but we'll look at some of these things that are very much a part of uh, what he learned. And well, here's uh, the first one is the horse clam. That has a very interesting, uh, it's a very large one. Now Ed probably should take over from here. I don't know if you want to show this student's exhibit here to give you an idea. These are the horse clams compared to the one of the main thing he collected with his uncles and aunties and moms, the, the little necks. And uh, butter clams were another one they collected for buyers in Seattle. And mussels were used here for a bit. Not, this is more from Mud Bay where we have native um, oysters here. I don't know if you can see that. Ed, you want to... <clears throat> But uh, I think the horse clam was one of the most important clams that that our people gathered. Um, they're easier to dig. They're only about knee deep or even shallower. And uh, we have a gooey duck out here that's, uh, that's about waist deep. Well, they're much harder to, to get. So these horse clams were gathered out here on the tide flat in front of my house here, and and they were uh, they were dried, they were cooked over a fire, or they were dried hard, and uh, they were such an important food that uh, people hiked all the way from. Idaho as far as Montana to come out here and trade for dried horse clams because they're uh, they're really uh, they're really a, a, a very nutritious food and once they're dried they're uh, they're good for for years <laughs> once they're dried and and this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, weaving this uh, beaded this beaded bag uh, weaving that I have here uh, came from Yakima from the Klickitat area oh, and was uh, was uh, traded to uh, Chief Wahoku for. Uh, for dried horse clams, and uh, and I can date this uh, because the these yellow greasy uh, uh, Russian beads were uh, found their way out here in the late in the early eighteen hundreds and the late seventeen hundreds. So this was done. Uh, couple hundred years ago <laughs> and uh, so I still have this uh, this this bed this bag here with that story behind it yeah the um it says right on the back you know he wrote it down from his great grandmother's description of it back in the in the 90s uh, and uh <clears throat> and he, uh a horse clam was a. Uh, uh, we called it. Uh, we called it clam candy because uh, hmm. once it's cooked, uh, it's got a kind of a sweet, uh, kind of a sweet candy taste to it. <laughs> so, uh, so it was. Uh, uh, the neck part and the body part, you can eat the whole clam. And they weigh about, uh, they weigh about three to six pounds. 
each clam. Uh, whereas the gooey duck weighs from uh, from three pounds to fifteen pounds. One of the the larger gooey duck clam, and mm -hmm. so you get uh, you get two or three of those horse clams. You got a lot of uh, you got a, a quite a few meals really. <laughs> We were also fortunate that uh, his great grandmother was uh, interviewed in the fifties. So in the book, not only do we have Ed's uh, what you know he's his words on these, but we also have his great grandmother's words from note cards that this anthropologist uh, wrote up and eventually were published. So you can see um, that as well. And then he talks about cleaning these too and how she cooks them and the whole process of, uh, of uh, well, uh, using these to make a good living. Well, if we're going to write about it, we might as well include uh, how they were, how they were uh, gotten, how they were dug, how they were uh, cleaned and how they were prepared and how they were cooked and... <laughs> That's something you don't see in the archaeological sites. All, as many of that, them. Uh, all yes. that information. Yeah, but you, uh, you, you know they're using them. And, uh, uh oh, I just got stuck again. Hold on a second. Quick, quick, I think quick. I... Um, um, okay. I'm going to go back to share and see if this will work. <clears throat> Sometimes it sticks for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, so then we look at the other sites. And again, we don't have all this information Ed provides. We definitely have the occurrence and somewhat the frequency. But if you look at Ed's family, you know, they were of the shellfish. They they were getting 20, 30, 25, 20, 30%. Uh, and then these other sites, mostly around Seattle, you see them common. This site seems like it's on Lake Washington, but it's on a waterway, so they must be getting the horse clams out of here in L.A. At Bay. Uh, but you get an idea that these things were were used. They're, of course, different environments, but they were certainly part of making a living off the land for up to 4,000 years, West Point out here. Uh, this is a place Ed spent a lot of time on with his uncles. Uh, both, uh, you can see where the shellfish beds are in this area, but they are also major area for salmon fishing. It's called Jeff Head down here, uh, right in this, right here. Do you want to say anything about Jeff Head? It's about three miles away from where he lives. Well, Jeff Head was kind of a sacred uh, tribal lands, and fortunately it stayed uh, tribal lands. Uh, we lost all our other tribal lands, our other uh, trust lands were all sold off and gone. But fortunately, Jeff Head was uh, kind of a big marshland out there. The tide went in and filled it up and, and drained it every day at high tide and low tide. So nobody could really build back there so it stayed uh, natural but there was a deal back in the 1950s that uh, the Seattle the city of Seattle needed a place to uh, put all their uh, garbage and they actually proposed to the tribe that we uh, we lease them the land and they bring Seattle garbage over and fill that whole thing up with Seattle garbage. And then they said, and then once we do that, then it'll be, uh, it'll be uh, probably uh, 15, 20 feet deep. And then you guys can build on it again. <laughs> and then you guys can use the land to build. 
Sounds like. <laughs> of course, we said no, no. We don't want those. <laughs> we don't want no Seattle garbage spoiling. Such a beautiful our, spot. <laughs> spoiling our natural preserve there. Now here's salmon, uh, and uh, Ed was quite involved in salmon in all ways, but. Uh, uh, as some of their earlier references are, they, they use these gill nets out of nettle fiber string, but he had his own gill net that he'd go out after he repaired it. His uncle gave it to him. Um, he had, <clears throat> what we do? Well, we're, net, but it's, uh, we're down on my beach there and, and across the way of Seattle over there, Bainbridge Island, Seattle over there, and and uh, so we're right on the Indianola water pump beach there, displaying my one of my first nettle fiber gill nets there. You made these cedar floats out of uh, uh, into salmon figures, but these are ancient two to three thousand year old style pebble anchors we find uh, in the Puget Sound and. Salish Sea area that are on that bound with cherry bark. We don't we don't have any here to show us. We, but Ed has a whole stack of them next door. Oh, we, you find a forked stick and you find a rock on the beach and you stick it in there and you, you bind it in with with wild cherry bark or spruce root and, and then you got an anchor to hang on the bottom of your net. Yeah. And for thousands of years, we we find those. I just need enough weight to hold it down so the salmon. And all, end the, all these archaeology sites, they found old ones in there. Yeah, and you can see the coastal sites like Ed's Ed's where we are right here doesn't have a river right here. You know, they they certainly got a lot of salmon, but you get into these river sites in Seattle and. And it's most of the fish <laughs> is salmon. Fish are salmon. And uh yeah. but for four thousand years again. So it's not overused, not depressed, you know, it's a viable ducks. And we use Suquamish names, and we've been wondering how how far up back that might be recognized, but nets were used, and Julia describes nets she was involved with, with her family when she followed them to get the ducks out of the net. You can get a lot of ducks this way. Oh, there was a area down on the end of the sand spit, just down about a mile from my house to the west of my house there. That The ducks, uh, that was a pathway for the ducks to fly in and out of Miller's Bay into the sound and into Miller's Bay. And so our people were pretty clever. They uh, they put these poles up at low tide out there, just off of shore. And then at high tide, they took their net and they tied them to the poles. So the net was from a high tide level on up. And then uh, all these ducks would be in there feeding, uh, especially when the herring would come in and lay herring row on the bottom of the sand there, and they'd be in there feeding and feeding. And so the guy would be, uh, or the person would be hiding behind the logs up there. And when all the ducks dove down, he would run down to the water and he'd just beat on the water real, real strongly with a board or a pole paddle or some stick. And, and it would scare the ducks so bad, that sound coming through, that they would just come flying up out of the water and and guess what? They'd fly right into the net, and uh, and we'd uh, catch a lot of ducks that way. Now, just today, there was hundreds of widgeon ducks out in front of his beach here. Uh, so you 
you had to want a lot of ducks and usually it's for a party for a potlatch because you get hundreds of ducks and uh so you, these things were used only in this area of the northwest coast nowhere else do you see these giant duck nets i don't know i don't know if liz sees them up uh cowichan area or not but they were very common through this part of uh the salish sea yeah, they were pretty common down here yeah. in the in the Seattle uh, uh, area and and all throughout Puget Sound down here. I got Ed this uh, <laughs> decoy, so you'll get an idea. But it's like a duck gill net, and you can get hundreds of ducks. <laughs> and Ed could go through and does exactly how. He butchered them to give to Julia to put in the the duck soup, uh, which they had going often on the cook stove. Uh, I don't know if anything about butchering here, but um, one thing that we find a lot of in archaeological sites are these um, ends uh, of the wing, this metacarpal, metacarpal. But I think that's held on and skinned skinning the ducks for getting the the skins with the down on them to make blankets which would be equivalent to making woolly dog blankets uh as far as wealth uh it, and we show this at ozette we had 37 duck down blankets found where you had strings wrapped with duck skins with the down on them and then twined together with sinew and um uh, lots of lots of blankets made out of duck down um uh and uh they're right. said to be very warm there's certainly one of the smithsonian lives by james two actually from james swan but it's another kind of making the wealth just like wool dogs would make your your blankets i think ducks were almost as important to make your down blankets well when i cleaned the ducks my grandma I always had to save all the down yeah. and a few feathers. Uh, she got this uh, this material out of the Cirrus Roebuck catalog and these large uh, a bag type. And she'd fill that whole bag with uh, with duck down and feathers and then she'd sew it into a mattress and that's what I slept on when I was little was all these duck feathers that I had collected yeah it uh, it, it was uh, an important part of the duck for sure and and uh Ed, Ed had no insulation in the house where they, he grew up, so uh, <laughs> so uh, well, we it, had it was to, good to have down comfort, and he, and he was always very warm. There's so we had to have uh, because uh, it was just as cold in the house as it was outside. <laughs> <laughs> so I sink into that big thick. Uh, mattress that grandma made was and stay nice and warm and then if my feet were cold uh she heated these bricks on the on the wood stove she'd have them on the wood stove all day long and they'd be nice and warm so she'd wrap those bricks in uh, towels and she'd put them in, at the foot of my bed Fortunately, none of. Fortunately, they didn't catch any fire or anything. <laughs> but, but my feet were nice and warm all yeah. night from those, from those warm bricks. <laughs> yeah, he had a broken window, and one big snowy night, he woke up the next morning with foot of snow on the bottom of his bed. <laughs> so the snow had blown in. Uh, was on my right on my bed there. <laughs> uh. So you can see uh, a big duck net Ed made and, and as commissioned again by this Astoria Maritime Museum. Uh, and uh, 
these are the ducks weren't very well tabulated in these nine sites. Old Man House is pretty close to what Ed was doing. Ed and family had a certain amount of grebs and quite a bit of ducks, other things like geese and otherwise. Uh, but here's Old Man House, similar thing at seven for 1700 years. A little different down here at Duwamish which is at the mouth of uh, the Duwamish River, but a lot more grebs, a lot more grebs. And then when you see this village here, which is a river that goes into the Duwamish, uh, again, lots of ducks. So we're seeing it's an important resource, but it, we don't have a lot of duck experts to uh, identify them in all the sites. It's usually not covered too well. Um, like I said, they always had lots of ducks because his uncles were very good at a deer. Deer, I mean, because his uncles were very good deer hunters. Um, but you can see for 4,000 years, that's a major resource. That's deer and elk in these sites. Uh, but it's a big part of the, the mammal meat that Ed and family had. Uh, and so you can see that's a major resource throughout about 20 miles uh, of Ed. And uh, they had only one bear, he remembers. <laughs> his uncle got a bear. My uncle, his great uncle, Lawrence. My great uncle, Lawrence, I went up there to visit, and his wife was cooking this uh, these steaks <laughs> on the wood stove there. She was frying them. And, oh, you, wanna, you want to, uh, you want one of these steaks? I said sure, and and then after I ate it, she said, uh, she said I was eating bear meat that my that my great uncle had just uh, yeah. gotten from the from the property here. <laughs> and that's true in all those sites. Hardly any bear, you know. Bear Ed remembers one in his lifetime. This gets a little involved, but I just want to show you the continuity uh, shellfish in sites that are coastal into riverine or certain, certainly a lot of uh, little neck and uh, and uh, butter clams like Ed used, certain amount of uh, horse clam and barnacles in some of the sites uh, that are riverine. When you get to deer Wapato, again, deer's quite a bit. This, this little black spot here is all the bear bones you get in these sites. The bear was not a big resource. You get into salmon, you know, especially on the rivers where they're congested, you see a ton. But it's a big thing in Ed's fisheries too. Uh, when relatively speaking, you see these resources are quite variable, but each site's in a different environment with different resources. But I think the main thing is the resource continuity for 4,000 years is without any overusing of the resources for that amount of time or driving any species to extinctions. And unfortunately, that's kind of the pattern we see in our own use of these resources. Uh, when we get into plant foods, uh, berries are important, like I say, and uh, uh, this was something he collected uh, with through... Uh, instructions from his uh great grandmother yeah, these, julia uh, these little tiny uh uh huckleberries here uh she would tie this basket around my waist here and i would have to hike back up in on the property there and pick those huckleberries and not come back until the basket was full and so I would go out there and pick and pick and pick and get that nice and full of huckleberries and also the trailing wild blackberries, the the native uh, wild blackberries also. So I. Uh, <laughs> this is so a smaller got... one, but that's that's a cook that's a cooking basket that he replicated. So we got right. a little uh, basket here that uh, uh, this was my uh, 
this was Chief Wahochut's uh, personal cooking basket here. It's lost its and bottom. It lost its bottom. <laughs> and it's got burn marks on the inside from hanging uh, from hanging hot rocks in there to boil foods in. So I decided to uh, to replicate that basket and get into hard coil basket making. And so I uh, I uh, copied the patterns and put my uh, let me show it up. Put see my, how that, uh, see you can see the two patterns are the same. This is, of course, very old. It's and made great great uh, grandfather's cooking. Fire. And uh, made this basket and and uh, the uh, the red is a uh, wild cherry bark. And uh, the black is horsetail root. The skin off a of horsetail root is very weavable. And then the bear grass, the white bear grass, for the red and the black and the white uh, pattern there. See that machine up close. And beautiful, beautiful work. And so that got me into. Uh, Hard coil basket basketry there. Um, and I find interesting is his one of his big job was to get firewood or should say bark for his great grandmother uh, to to do the cooking. And so he he went out. This is uh, Doug fir trees and the bark off of it. So back back when I was being raised, why? There were always uh, logging and floating logs uh, in front of my house there. Yeah, the logs that ended on the beach. And uh, taking them up to the Port Gamble sawmill there. And, and those logs would run together and rub and bark would come off and float in on my beach. And so I'd have to go down there with a big gunny sack and fill it up with chunks of bark and pack it up, get it up to the house for the fire. And and it just, it burns so well. But the only problem with that is that <laughs> it was, uh, there was a lot of salt in it from mm -hmm. the salt water. So our little wood stoves that we bought um, we'd get them from Goodwill over in Seattle or the Salvation Army. Uh, they would only last uh, oh, three to five years huh. and then they would uh, the salt would uh, they would just burn right through the middle and, huh. and the stove would fall huh. apart. <laughs> wow. So uh, that was the only part of them. But it sure burned good. It was a it was a good uh, a good hot burning wood, or good hot. Yeah, and I we're looking at the archaeological sites. They did flotation of samples of the site, and every one of them, dug fir bark was the most abundant uh, material. And not only you know it was charcoal, but bark was found in in every one of these sites that uh, they analyzed. So it was a long time used, very hot wood, no smoke, uh, right, you know, to what Ed was doing with his great grandmother to make their uh, warmth and cooking. Um, like we said, uh, clam baskets are his specialty. Uh, and he used them to make a living for a while, but they go way back. You can see off Seattle here, what might be uh, Princess Angela or Chief Seattle's, Angela, Chief Seattle's daughter here with two classic clam baskets, some off of um, Jamestown here. You can see that's a classic clam basket from the 1800s. There's one over here by Curtis too, that's a group of baskets. Um, but we had a sales record so we could do these estimations and and then i collected for the book examples from the 70s from the 80s from the 90s from 2000 2010 and 
2020, uh, and uh, over 700 so far of these clam busts, just a tremendous, and the, they're the clam buskets because they're to make a living off the lamb to help, uh, which he actually did uh, collect clams to make a little spending money when he was young. Then when I uh, decided to make to bring it back in the 1970s, I was told that uh, no, there's no market for them, nothing. So I made a whole bunch of them, and I and our little uh, community of Indianola here, they have a special sale on Christmas, just before Christmas. And so I put them up there. And they all sold. <laughs> <laughs> so I told this go, oh, there is a market for these. <laughs> yeah. And there and he has a lifetime warranty on these baskets. Uh he just got one from when? Nineteen I one I made in two thousand. 2000 uh, and the some guy broke around here and he's going to repair it for some, this uh, neighbor some guy got rough with it and broke the handle on one side so i'm gonna fit some new pieces in and get that handle back together <laughs> and limbs he's got some limbs to show you uh, are his main warps, you know, his main sticks in the basket, and so it's right from a limb, right from these, uh, from these, uh, these cedar limbs here that I, that I collected, different, different size ones here. I use the bigger ones for, for the larger baskets. And the smaller ones for the smaller baskets. Oh, like Ayla showed you the basket. She's yeah. Ayla. So, so these are mainly the the limb, and then the and then the root for the weaver for the weft of the basket. You see it pulling a nice root here. So I'm pulling a cedar root out of the ground there, and. Uh, and I've got a cedar limb there. I'm pulling a little cedar bark over here off of it. Off of stored in his storehouse here. The, these uh, we find all the time in archaeological sites from the very beginning of, uh, you know, the 4,000 year time period. We had no idea what this was. We had, yeah. So we called them circulates. And then we realized from Ed, I found these coils, and what in the world are these coils, you know? And I said, well, look at, I I harvest my limbs, and I put them in my roots, and I put them in coils. Yeah. <laughs> and so in like 2006, he invited our students up to help him sort out his materials. And this is him <laughs> having my students help him with all these. And I said, okay, that's what a circulate is from all these sites. <laughs> And really, in his area, all the ancient sites for thousand, you know, for three thousand years, are cedar limb and root is the main material. Not so much like the north cedar bark. It's all the same tree, uh, and kind of a mix on the west coast. So, very, you know, his clam baskets are reflective, and that's what we find, and that's what he excavated with us at Mud Bay here. Uh, were clam baskets essentially made out of cedar limbs and roots. And then what bark we found was oftentimes maple bark and not cedar bark. Uh, the wood <laughs> is needed uh, as to gather materials and particularly transportation. And he's made these two seagoing canoes. Uh, and he's the oldest skipper at 89 in the, in the, the canoe journeys here. And this is this is the canoe he has today, and he skippers it. Wishy Dot is his great great grandmother, Wahulchu's wife. And then the smaller one he made first uh, was uh, named Julia, and it's it's on display in the lobby of the casino resort. Um, 
but this one's in his garage right here he uses and we may turn it over to redo the bottom a bit later this this year so we hope spencer can help us melinda if you're on anything you want to say about so the new I, carmen i went on a I went on a really long canoe journey in uh, in uh, 1993. We paddled from uh, Seattle up to uh, uh, up to uh, uh, Alert Bay. Up to no way up to halfway up oh, to Bella, Bella Coola or something. To uh, Bella Bella. Bella, Bella. No, about a halfway up to Alaska, <laughs> and it took us thirty-three days to paddle up there from uh, from Seattle or from the Suquamish Reservation, and we were in a borrowed canoe, and that canoe was so chippy, you know, I should just turn sideways like that and almost tip the thing over. <laughs> So then after that trip, I decided I have to have my own canoe. And so I secured a log and and I carved a little small one, the 18 footer. And I traveled in that for a couple of years and it was just too small. So then I got a bigger log in 1993, 1996. And so I started carving the bigger canoe with the uh, with the wonderful help of Dwayne Pasco, who is a very renowned canoe carver. In he our, just lives up the hill here in our area there or by Paul's for there and so he guided me and and I ended up with this uh with Weesey Dog canoe the 26 footer where did you go first well it's a little bit on the small side but <laughs> it goes it does well and so I've been paddling all over Puget Sound up and down the coast, uh, like to uh, uh, Quinault and and uh, Macaw and uh, and uh, Quileute Tribe and La Push and but uh, but one of the most challenging uh, journey was a house it a house it is on the west coast of Vancouver Island up about three quarters of the way up the island. And here I am out there with it, paddling in this 26 foot canoe with uh, six inches of freeboard <laughs> with uh, five paddlers in it, five to six paddlers. And here we are paddling up the west coast of Vancouver Island. In it. <laughs> and it was just uh, one of the most awesome journeys that uh, I think we've ever taken with the with the canoe. I think this was the trip to Ahazet. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think this was one of the pictures of going to Ahazet with it. Yeah. And uh, Spruce Root, he goes out to the West Coast where he learned to, to get this material from Macaw teachers of his and Quinault Quileute. But here he is with a big bunch of spruce root and making a spruce root hat. I mean, yeah, this is spruce root here. Uh, it's a Macaw whaler hat, yeah, chief's this hat. Is a, this is a spruce root whaler's hat. It, uh, the knob on the top uh, identified a whaler. A whaler was pretty important person, so he had to have identification. So they came up with this uh, spruce root hat uh, with a knob on the top of it. So I made this, so I gathered enough spruce root there uh, to, uh, to weave this hat out of spruce root here. Yeah, and uh... 
when we travel and sometimes we go to Japan or Europe, he wears it in the airport so I can keep track of him. You know, he'd be out and about. But, uh, so it's a wonderful hat. The Smithsonian, no, no, no. The American Museum of Natural History, actually, uh, Audrey, this was breaking off right here. And your uh, staff, you had a very good repair person on baskets and he, and she fixed it for Ed. And uh, boy, that wouldn't have lasted much longer. So he, mm -hmm. he has a, a lot more use of it after they helped him. Um, cherry bark, we talked about making, uh, getting it off. Now he has a, a, a show you how you get cherry bark off. You don't take the inner bark, you just do the outer. So the plant, doesn't matter if you girdle it, it'll girdle it, it'll uh, survive fine. Oh, I just wanted to mention about wild cherry, the choke cherry that grows natural native in our area. Uh, it has, uh, it's one of the few trees that have two layers of bark. Uh, this this layer sure. here, this inner layer right here, and then it's got this uh, this outer covering here, uh, this outer layer that runs around, and this layer runs up and down the length of the tree, and this runs around the tree. And we, uh, for, for the design in the hat and the basket, you use this... Uh, you use this thin outer layer here. You scrape this and it really turns nice, beautiful you, red. Once you... Oh, there's your knife. I was looking Once there. you scrape this with a knife and you scrape that... Uh, you scrape that outer uh, layer there off of it. Better and then you so they can see it a little bit yeah and then you get that uh you get that wonderful red uh, I'll, I'll move it forward you get that wonderful red uh, wonderful red shiny color and it's uh and it's that color the whole way through it's like so, uh, right here. so you that get the, the little pieces to do to imbricate and and do that be do the design work on the on on the weavings there so i just wanted to show that the two layers of uh, the yeah. two layers of bark on this uh, so you can't you're not going to damage the kill the tree by taking off and this bark is part. this bark is so strong that it, it it stretches like a rubber band. See, this piece of wood dried out and it has all these splits in it. And uh, ordinarily that would have just split right in half. But the wild cherry bark is holding it. It's holding it together like a big rubber, like a big rubber band around it. <laughs> it's very good in water. And that's why these anchor stones that Ed made out of those pebbles in two or three thousand year old sites are wrapped with cherry bark to keep uh and, and to keep them together on the bottom of the net the wild cherry bark must have a special preservative in it because it does not rot away it stays this was found at uh mud bay it's a koi these are millimeters uh, cherry bark on a cedar stick with just a green pebble wrapped into it so it's very you know some poor young person lost their toy must have been very frustrating but for us that's uh, fox and this is the, one of the biggest finds we found uh, in both these cases archaeologically if you found that pebble or this pebble you wouldn't think anything of it it's not modified it's not clearly an artifact unless it's a wet site Tules, uh Ed did a whole Thule mat lodge, and you need these to make a living off the land. It's just like the campsite he had down in uh, Jeff Head. They they covered 
temporary structures when they went out to fishing camps, shell fishing camps, even hunting camps. Uh, and Ed made one of these for the museum. You can see his cat, Unu. I couldn't bring Unu over because uh, Beverly has a giant dog here. <laughs> so Uno's over next door, but Ed's trying out his, and they're all so great, you know, mattresses. No doubt our Anglo term mattress comes from a time when we slept on mats. And it's a female gender mattress. It's like princess or dress. So for some reason we uh, associated mattresses with female. I don't know if you want to say anything about your cat here, but beautiful cat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That little kitty there is one of the best pets I've ever had. Thanks she so just much. loves to be with you and petted and and uh, always uh, a great friend. Oh, yeah. Maybe we can bring the dog in here at the yeah. end here. <laughs> well, this is really wanted to say that you know, uh, it's it's like Liz said her and. Uh, uh, Audrey had uh, Deborah Sparrow uh, as one of their authors on the Wooly Dogs, and she recounts her involvement with uh, recovering Salish textiles, uh, which were only a memory to her, you know, for her grandparents' generation, to bring it back to sh to recognize these masters, just like we recognize the two thousand year old master from uh, Snoqualmie River, Beaterboss. We want to make sure our people who lived thousands of years ago um, feel justified in their existence by the work that reflect is, reflects them today. That has been our goal, to be able on a large scale to share and reflect with the whole region and the world the integrity and intelligence of the people who existed in this land prior to arrival of the Europeans. So a lot of this is to demonstrate this uh, longevity of people for thousands of years who made an excellent living off the land without causing any uh, disruption in terms of overuse. So when we collaborated with basketry, uh, we certainly showed the integrity and intelligence of uh, Salish and peoples and providing in this case, subsistence and quality of life for their community for the same period. Adding Ed and uh, uh, his family's ecological knowledge for making a living off the land, demonstrating this continued threat of knowledge in their beautiful Salish Sea area of the world. As stated by the national leader, environmentalist in uh, Nisqually, the late Billy Frank Jr., you've got to know what you're talking about from way back to where we are today. And we think Billy would be pleased with our joint effort. Um, this is the half size model of uh, Billy Franks that they're gonna have as one of two statues uh, in the state, in the United States Capitol in the statuary hall for the state of Washington. He, he uh, should be installed and uh, Billy certainly knew that we had to look way back to where we are today. And uh, so anyway, we uh, thank you for uh, staying with us. I think we went an hour and 15 minutes, not too bad. And uh, but uh, thanks for hosting us. Uh, and uh, Ed, Ed, and Ed, we really appreciate uh, him having a neighbor that lets us give this PowerPoint in, in where she has internet. Uh, and then we hope you can practice generationally linked archaeology into your deep and rich past. So we're going to stop here for questions or discussion. Uh, let me get out of this. <laughs> Oh, there's Ian McCutch McCutchney. Oh. Hi, Ian. And uh, so if you want to uh, ask questions, feel free. I'd like to know what uh, uh, Ian and uh, Liz and Audrey thinks of this. Uh, Matt, are you with us? <laughs> yeah, so if you could come in, uh, there he is. That's uh, the zooarchaeologist at the University of Victoria and works with Liz and Audrey. Audrey might have gone to bed. 
<laughs> it's got to be really late in New York. No, ah, I'm still here. <laughs> So any <laughs> questions on this? Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to working with Ian and uh, and uh, Audrey and Liz. I don't know what you think about how we compared this to the uh, sites within 20 miles of Ed's place, uh, Ian, but we're seeing a lot of continuity and interesting pattern. Of course, each site, you know, fauna and is in Florida is going to be distinct to the location that oh I just think it's so great to hear and see all the different uh connections you guys are making and the beautiful photos uh and baskets uh and uh what a wonderful set of bar charts as well love those with and talking okay. about all the different shellfish uh and the ways in which you harvested and tasted um and kept warm all of those things so great and just to to celebrate that a bit there's a you know virginia butler and sarah campbell's wonderful piece that synthesized a lot of the efforts to think about that question about resources over time and consistency and sustained sustained use and um, you're showing that as well and with more specific local examples so it's really exciting well yeah thanks ian uh, it really isn't my ball <laughs> to be frank with so it's really a learning experience to go this direction and uh Fortunately, I've worked with people like yourself and Rebecca Wigan and others who keep me on the straight and narrow that uh, we felt there was so much Ed could add to the, uh, you know, behavior of the animals, the how you capture them, how you process them, how you cook them, how they taste. <laughs> he certainly knows the difference between different ducks and different things, how they taste. Uh, and, uh, you know, and and also how you store them because it's berries too they stored their berries his great grandmother canned them uh but she talks about you know drying them too from her experience so we were lucky to have that 1950s interviews of his great grandmother that raised him <clears throat> yeah so what time is it audrey <laughs> It's got to be like it's eleven twenty four. But no, I thought that it was. I it was really. It was. It's re, the the presentation. It's it's so it's it's so great. I I I I know. So you know, this is. I'm I I'm a geneticist. Um, and all like so much of this information, this knowledge, um, the ecological information uh is is new to me and it's just so it's so fascinating um and um i i don't even know where to to start um with with um with questions because it's it's i'm just trying to pro trying to process uh everything that that had been presented but um i i enjoyed um uh I, I think that you definitely, um, I think that Billy definitely would be pleased by your joint effort. I think that the the quote that you had from uh, Deborah at the end, uh, it, it totally, <laughs> yeah, totally encapsulates what what you've done. It's incredible. Um, I would like a cookbook <laughs> of um, of all of the the foods um, that that you were talking about because it, it sounds amazing yeah um I, 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 ad makes ed makes it real clear he's never was hungry never <laughs> you know i mean uh his great grandmother was always there and always taking care of him which is tells you something there as long uh, as the as long as the tide went in and as long as the tide came or went out we we had food <laughs> <laughs> and they're widging out there all over the beach this just this afternoon <laughs> the ducks um i know audrey talked to uh 
uh, Paul Gleason, Dr. Paul Gleason, who did and directed the OSEP project while I was there. And uh, he did the the duck the dog remains from Ozette for his masters. So I'm sure glad you got a hold of him. And hopefully, you know, keep in touch with him. Sometimes you need his help to to really mm -hmm. make the connections and de develop a relationship with the macaws. And I don't know where those dog remains are, but did he well, say? It's a, <laughs> are those dog he, remains probably in Nia Bay? I would think. He put me in contact with somebody um, at, at the at Ma, Macaw. Um, so hopefully, hopefully they'll get back. But right. um, <laughs> but yeah, he it was it was actually I had I talked to him on the phone for like two hours and um, and he had told me to to um, to get these these books uh, and I <laughs> got. Oh yeah, yeah, that's an excellent book. Uh, yeah, a friend and, of um, friend of, Rao, of uh, Ed's here wrote it, Ruth Kirk, and uh, yeah, that's a good book too. But the yeah. but Ruth Kirk, uh, we we thought mm -hmm. she would get the Washington State Award for that book that year it came out. We Ed and I were there, and unfortunately, it went somewhere else. But. But she's very courageous to write a book. <laughs> it needed to be done. We all helped her to some degree, you know, looked at it. Yeah. What do you think, Liz? You have any comments? Yeah, I was just fascinated that, you know, 70 years after Ed's great grandmother was interviewed, that you can you can weave that thread yeah um, to We're now <laughs> and then but also go back so many thousands of years right when you look at the baskets yeah, yeah it's just it's that's fascinating really, yeah. that's our my bag more than zoark but yeah. uh i like i say i have good help but yeah mm -hmm. basketries are solid but yeah. you know if you think about it how much stylish characteristics the bones have you know it's not an, a kind of thing like baskets where you can really see how uh, you identified these baskets identify uh, mm -hmm. Ed. You know, these things we show here are very characteristic thing of Salish people for thousands of years that we're seeing. And uh, so it's identity there. But I, I would say, you know, the resources too have a certain amount of, uh, you know, linkage to the people too you know because they, they they're all in different environments whether they're duwamish or down at uh, old man house or so forth but you probably specialized in getting the the resources that were very abundant and share them you know and trade across and uh it's, it's pretty interesting <laughs> well when you uh when you look into basketry it really tells the story of the people because uh, uh, why did they make that basket? Why did they make that hat? Why did they make a cooking uh, hard coil watertight basket? Why did they make a backpack burden basket? Uh, why did they make a uh, fishing a little dip net, you know, and when you look at all that, it tells you the story of the the life of the people, the way they live, the things they they've done. <clears throat> Anybody else? That up. It Hi, Dale. Hi. This, this is Rick Fraker. Oh, hi. And I have a question for Ed. Uh, first of all, I want to say what a wonderful presentation. And I, I sat here all night listening uh, to the descriptions of growing up. And I myself grew up in the shoreline area right across from where Ed grew up. Yeah. And uh, actually lived in a house on the beach oh. uh, for about for the last 10 years. Wow. Um, and I always, always would look over across the bay to Port Madsen and uh, wonder what was going on over there. 
<laughs> but my question for you is I've been over to the Suquamish uh, Museum many, many times and looked at your some of your work that's on display. But uh, one of the things I, I remember in one of the sp display cases was that some of the uh, folks uh, working the beach in that area used to go under the water and search for uh, you know different fish or or something like that. And there's a there's a small presentation on some like scuba equipment that that folks developed back in the day. And I wonder if you had any any recollection of anybody uh, going under the water looking for food. No, I didn't have any. Uh, the only time uh, in my lifetime, the only time I heard of people going under the water was with the scuba, with diving, with the oxygen tanks and diving yeah. gear and harvesting. Our tribe is really big at harvesting the gooey duck out there and selling it to China. Uh, and we have to dive down to the 60 foot level to harvest these these large gooey ducks that are down there. But they do wear the regular uh, tanks and masks and oxygen. And okay. I, I, I thought I remember seeing something that kind of described pre, you know, uh, quite a long, quite a long time ago, folks learning how to figure out a way to see underwater and hold their breath and uh, come back to the surface with some type of of uh, animal. But well, there there probably was some of that because some of those uh, some of those uh, oh. Uh, uh, Either crabs or sea urchins or or uh, uh, sea cucumbers and stuff are shallow enough where where a person could dive down there and collect a few of them and come back up again. Okay, well, thank you. Ed Ed used to go get crab with a rake, and he'd have to you know wade to his waist and a hip waiter or chest waders. Uh, and rake Dungeness and uh, edible crab and occasionally spare a, a flatfish and, and put it into a wash tub that it would be tied <laughs> to them. That I towed behind me. And yeah, that's at night with, uh, with lanterns. A, with a lantern. And so you're trying to get these see what's old, down there. Uh, these big old Dungeness crab. And back then they were huge. Back then, we didn't take them unless they were 10, 12, 13 inches across the back. <laughs> yeah. We suspect what we're doing will help future people in working on uh, management and uh, rights, too. Uh, and uh, and so... Uh, you know, it gives us a, it gives everybody that this longer term look right through to what Ed was able to to do in the first part of his life and uh, and uh, and learn from this. You know, so it's kind of taking some archaeology to 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 also look at this four thousand years of continuity and not overuse and not extinction of anything. So we can say, hey, this has got to come back. <clears throat> Anybody else? Matt, what do you think? <laughs> he might he might not be there, is he? <laughs> but uh Joe Lynn might still be on. Lynn, Joe Lynn, how are you doing? Hi, Dale. Hi, Ed. It's so nice to hear your presentation tonight. So Thank you. you meet Ed out at Hoko. Yeah, yep. Kids uh, in, the, in the background here too. So, <laughs> yep. Okay. Yep. We've got, got Eleanor and Theodore here. They've been listening a little bit this evening as well. So, thank you. Yes. 
Mm. Well, Tom, Tom's here, Murphy. Let's see if he has. Tom's worked a lot on on salmon restoration and a number of excavations too. Thomas, <laughs> he he comes out. Uh, but any other comments or questions? Sorry, I've. Uh, whoops. <laughs> I Tom. Tom. I've, uh, I really enjoyed this. I was eating crab <laughs> while I was touching oh. this crab while I was listening to this. And, and oh, uh, about it. You're, that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I got to uh, go out with some of those gooey duck fishers when I was running a uh, program for NOAA. Uh, we were training uh, K-12 through teachers how to do meaningful watershed education. And so they, they were just starting the high school uh, at, at Suquamish. And so we brought a, a 68 foot steel cruiser called the Indigo over and <clears throat> went out with the, the gooey duck divers and uh, the teachers got to learn how, you know, did, how to turn that into some class assignments and stuff. So that was, that was a lot of fun uh, with uh, Suquamish. That would have been, geez, about, 2009. Yeah, well, that uh, yeah. gooey duck is one of the largest clams in the world, uh, other than the giant clam down in the South Pacific there. But the gooey duck is the next largest clam in the world, and and they can get up to 15 pounds. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> You know, I should, we should have Ed explain how they dug gooey ducks off the beach here, because they're very hard. You know, in fact, the name in the shoots is "dig deep." <laughs> <laughs> we have it all. Uh, and you know, getting the gooey duck is a it's a real sport, really, because yeah. they're down there about waist deep. And as soon as you dig down there, the sand caves in on you and keeps the hole full, you know, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> and then, uh, so then uh, you get this uh, metal garbage can and and you cut the bottom out of it. And then you go out there and you find the gooey duck. He's, they like the sun. Mm -hmm they'll stick their neck up out of the sand and sun themselves. So you see this great big old neck sticking out of the sand there. And, and you go up there and you dig around it really fast with your shovel and get it down there. And then he wakes up and he starts going down. And then you put the garbage can in and you step on it and you push it way down to sand level. And then you dig inside of that. You dig and you dig and you dig and you get way down there and and that holds the sand back. And, and then you just dive inside of it and get down there with your long arms and, and reach down there and get him and, and loosen him up. And then he just floats up to the, floats up to the surface. And then, if you're lucky enough to get out of the garbage can, why you? <laughs> Come on, he got stuck once. <laughs> I got stuck. <laughs> Luckily, I had a couple guys, and they grabbed each leg and pulled me out. <laughs> got the we gooey duck. Doing going. this tonight. I wasn't going to give up. I wasn't going to let go of the gooey duck. <laughs> so they pulled me and the gooey duck out. <laughs> so when you think about that, you know, someone who could make either a wooden hoop or a bent wood box could actually, you know, through time be able to self dig gooey ducks probably like that, you know, where you would work your way down, put the bent wood box down a little further that's got no bottom mm. and get your yep. stuff. <laughs> it's I mean, probably worth worth the effort though, huh? Yeah. They're worth the effort. Taste. Yeah. yeah, that's it. But they're sure uh, tasty, a lot of meat. The whole yeah. thing is edible. <laughs> so, 
Yeah. Well, I enjoyed it very much. So uh, I, I went, I, how about the book that you're working on? When do you expect this to come out? Well, uh, it's, it's scheduled for the first of uh, the year, uh, January 1st. Of 2025? 20, yeah, so about, what is this? So maybe, you know, 10 months from now. Uh, right. We're, we're, it's pretty well complete. I'm trying to do a, you know, Ed didn't want any tables or charts like or percentage yeah. lists. So all those are in the appendix, but we have all the data from all those sites for the fauna and the flora, you know, from wet sites too. Um, and then those bar charts was because he said, hey, no, no, you know, we had a, uh, a reckoning on that. So no more lists of percentages there in those nice horizontal bar charts, uh, which are easier to, to follow in the appendix you can go to if you want to see the data. <laughs> And nice. Yeah, thanks. So it's, right. well, it's well, coming thanks. along. We'll present it. Uh, I will present it at the Northwest meetings. Oh, okay. Hey, Ed unfortunately has to be in Mexico on vacation, so <laughs> it'd just be me. But I'm going to take a bunch of these things with me to show pass around. Uh, but we'll be in New Orleans giving the talk as well. And uh, nice. yeah. yeah. And they're they're putting it in their their zooarchaeology interest groups because we were put into a not a zoark program but more uh, uh, you know indigenous communities presentations. But I think you know the zooarchaeologists that we've been in touch with are want us follow this, want to see this, and uh, so it's it's coming along. <laughs> yeah but but thank you any other comments i just want to thank beverly i don't know where she is are you around beverly <laughs> wanted you to meet her big dog but where, where's willa <laughs> and thank you and then uh also uh for uh you know she gave us her her place here for the internet and uh uh Matt, Matt's our president of the society and our IT person, and he's very busy right now because he's one of the computer scientists that's working on the uh, the rocketry like we just saw go to the moon, but with a different uh, group, Bezos group, that are doing this gigantic rocket that will go to Mars. Uh, Matt, are you with us? <laughs> hey, Matt. I know. Hey, I'm here. Oh. Okay, I was just thanking you. Is, oh, yeah. Do you have biscuit there? <laughs> I do. If you have any questions about the rocketry, I know he's interested in that. We're on a space race with China to get to the South Pole of the moon. And so that's why the big push right now. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Thanks so much, Matt, for recording it, too. Sure thing. Yeah, and we look forward to Liz and Audrey and Ian uh, in May. Thank you for uh, offering to do that with us. And we'll be in touch. And tell Deborah Sparrow, she's uh, our hero. We we probably could be up at the end of March to UBC uh, uh, um, at the museum just to give a talk on this this talk, basically, but much shorter probably <laughs> and uh but um but anyway uh um uh, we appreciate everybody coming tonight and we'll see you i hope soon i know vic's here vic are you still with us he's in arizona so like audrey is a little different time zone vic he's in arizona but thanks for coming any last statements or anything thanks audrey and uh get some sleep thanks and we'll we'll see everybody there she is <laughs> thanks ed well <laughs> we're 